Good morning, everyone. It's Thursday. You've almost made it through another week. And I'm here with my good friend, Sean Newfer. Little known secret, Sean may have been one of the original testers of Canvas many years ago when he was over at BYU Hawaii. So we're excited to have him here. Uh, he's doing some really cool things. Uh, today, he's, he's representing the TCS education system. And he is going to talk to us all about creating Canvas pages that look just amazing. So with no further ado, as always, make sure you put in the comments who you are, where you're from, and ask any questions that you might have of Sean throughout. I am going to drop right now in the comments so that you have it, um, a link to this page, this Canvas page design that, that Sean is going to show you. So with that, Sean, take it away, my friend. All right, let's rock and roll. Um, one of the questions that I get in my capacity as the director of teaching and learning, and before that I was the director of educational technology, is um, a lot of faculty would say, um, you know, Canvas is great, we love Canvas, but my pages are just so boring. Like, how can I dress them up? It's just text on a page. How can I make the assignments look better? You know, the content's there, content is king, and that's the most important thing, but I just want it to look nicer. I want it to look like a nice website. And there are certain things that we can't change, but there's a lot that we can work with. And so this session is going to be um, talking through that. What can we do as faculty? Now, I'm spe speaking specifically as a faculty, a teacher of the course, as opposed to an administrator or, or a student. So this is a course that I created just for the purpose of this interview uh, called Page Design in Canvas. You all have access to this course. It's public and published. And so you can scroll along with me. You'll have access to it after this uh, recording, so you can, you know, look through it. So I created a few um, interesting page designs that I want to talk you through. One, this is a common template that I use for my courses that has a banner and some descriptive text, and that's pretty much it. A few buttons at the bottom. I want to keep it minimal. I don't want to overwhelm students that the first thing they see in my course is an overwhelming amount of text and content that they have to get through. Um, so I want to keep it simple. About 50% of this is imagery that's uh, somewhat related to my course, just to, to welcome them into the course. I have a brief overview. And then I use these buttons, which um, are Canvas buttons, where I can link out to other pages, for example, the syllabus. Um, some of these are pop-up buttons, and so I can and display information on the page without cluttering the page that they can have access to it. Uh, but it's kind of hidden until they interact with the page. And so that's an approach that I like to do just to keep things looking clean, but still having all the information that we need, you know, the, the textbooks and things like that. So we're going to walk through, I'm going to go through um, the modules. Now I just realized that some of these buttons on the homepage are uh, I don't think I updated those for you know this course, but that would be an example. If you just hyperlink um, in the code to where you want to go, click on the modules, and that's where I'm going to spend a lot of the time um, during this meeting. So again, here's the uh, URL if you want to access this course. Of course, if you are in the course, then you already have the link to, to it. But for those who are watching, you can type this in bit.ly slash canvas page design. And I learned something interesting yesterday um, that this is something called um, camel case, where it's all one word. You know, you can't have spaces in URLs. It has to be alphanumeric uh, text, essentially. But you can distinguish words by putting a case, the uppercase letter of each word, and that's called camel case. And that's especially important, um, important in education as we use hashtags um, for screen reader purposes, that the screen reader, when they're reading, for example, if it was hashtag, Canvas page design or hashtag um, online learning, then you can capitalize those words and the screen reader will distinguish the words. Otherwise, the screen reader will just read characters and it won't sound good to the, the participants. So that's something I learned just yesterday, you know, an accessibility tip. Hey, Sean, let's yeah. take it. Let's take, there's some interest already in these pop-up buttons that you talked about. Lisa, one of our good friends who's here with us often uh, says pop-up buttons and then down below we have uh, Janetta, who's saying, will there be an issue with those pop-ups being blocked by the browser? Um, let's look at the code. I don't think there's an issue with them being blocked by the browser because they're not JavaScript. Uh, it does get a little complicated, but this is actually um, their CSS buttons, and they are part of the, the Canvas um, 
uh, what do you call that? The the style guide for Canvas. So they're actually in the Canvas external CSS, and I'm just um, referencing them. So what that looks like, and I I don't want to be intimidating here and show you a, a lot of text or a lot of code right off the bat. But essentially, I have a div, an ID, which is um, dialog for instructor. The class. This is what comes from Canvas. This is what they give us. The Canvas is enhanceable underscore content space dialog. And then I have my text that comes up, which is, you know, Sean Newfer, a phone number and an email, or it could be, you know, the, the name of the book. In that case, the class is the same. And then I use this div, the ID. I can create that whatever I want. So I have an ID dialog for text box, dialog for instructor with underscores. And then up here, I'd, I would just um, reference those. So let's look at. Um, where would that? So the class, the the buttons themselves are an ink, um, an anchor, and I, I don't want to get <laughs> complicated right off the way, but it's a class, and that's also given to me by instructor, instru instructor, um, and it's on on the back end. So I'm saying, here's a button, and the button is going to take me to this page. So it could be the modules page in my course, or it could be a pop up or or something. Um, in this case, let's let's isolate my professor button real quick. So I have a class, an anchor, and then the class is whatever instructor tells me that that happens to be the button that we saw. And then an href saying, when you click on this, and this being professor, and professor is the button, I want this to pop up on the screen. Dialog, hashtag dialog for instructor. And that's where I have done here. OK, dialog for instructor. The href refers to, to this ID. And then I have the content that I want. And so I know it's a little bit complicated, but um, worth Googling, worth spending some time. I'll just, um, it's kind of an appetizer. You can look up more, reach out to me um, offline if you want more specifics. But just get a sandbox course and start playing with these, uh, the concept of these buttons. And um, I like it because it really streamlines the um, the page where I can have lots of information without it looking like there's lots of information. And they just get the information that they need at that moment. And Which, Sean, um, to, to be clear on that, on Janetta's question, this will not, pop-ups will not be blocked by the browser with the way that Sean has it set up here, right? Right. Um, if it's JavaScript, that's where we, the, uh, it gets cleaned out by by canvas every time you really reload the page this is only these are only css um, interactions and so it's supported awesome all right let's look at the concept of an adaptive banner and a few years ago i gave a session where i talked about how you can use a table as an adaptive banner and i need to repent of that i need to say don't use tables um, we know since then that tables are really for accessibility purposes tables should be for data for information um, such as cataloging people and phone numbers or data sets you shouldn't use tables for aesthetic reasons but uh, we can substitute a table for a div and i'm going to show you how to do that so what an adaptive header is is this is an example where it spans the width of my page here and if i were to change this then you can see it spans the width and this icon that i have here in the middle um, you know, just always stays in the middle. And if I were to make this smaller, then you can see how it adapts, you know, in, in real time. So it's, it's good because it doesn't depend on a certain size for a browser where I have 27 inch monitors. Some people have 32 or 20 inch or some people are on their phones. And so we want to be uh, mindful of that responsiveness. <clears throat> so the two elements that I have for this adaptive banner, one is an image. And that's just an image that I created in um, PowerPoint. And let me, um, oh, I had a PowerPoint up um, on the side. I'll see if I can search for that again. But essentially, I, I made a box in PowerPoint. I put some text on top of the box, and I searched for an icon, really simple things. And then I highlighted all of those and um, just saved them as an image. You know, so so very, very simple. Um, I'm going to I'm going to try and show you how I did that. I had a Canvas thing. I think I, I had to restart my computer right before. I think it didn't save. 
Um, so let's, let's start that over again. Behind the image, I have a div, which is just one solid color. <clears throat> and that's the trick how I, I make this banner is that the image that I have here, you can see if I float around, that's just an image. It's solid. It's not gradient. And so I can't tell the edge of where the image stops and where the background begins. Um, and you can also, you know, you can make an image in something like PowerPoint or Photoshop or a sophisticated, um, if it's sophisticated system. But all I would do is I'd create some kind of box. I'm going to remove the outline so that it's just a colored box and either enter a text box or I can start typing right away. I can say my header. And I can change the font maybe to something a little bold and increase that. If I wanted to put an icon like I did right there, if you're using um, Office 365, if your institution has a subscription to that, then you actually have a whole library full of icons where I can search for, uh, for example, books or something. I can insert that and I can put that in there. Maybe I'll right align this and I'll change the color to something uh, white since the text is white. Or I can, if the text is a different color, I can make that a different color. All right, so let's uh, make some minor adjustments here. Great, now I have two elements. One is a box with some text in it, and one is my icon. I can highlight all of that stuff. My trick is that I'll highlight everything, and I'll copy or cut it, and then paste it as an image. Now, for some reason, it I might need to crop it a little bit. So I'm just going to make sure that it's only the image and not that white space. Great. Now I can right click and save the pic save it as a picture. And you can choose a JPEG, a PNG. We're going to talk about the difference between those two. Save it onto your computer and then upload it into Canvas. And then you just want to make sure that the div is the right color as um, the color that you chose for this. And how I do that. Um, is, and I'm trying to show you free tools. Most people have PowerPoint. You can do this in um, slides or you know, Google or Keynote if you want. I have a program called eyedropper, I as in E-Y-E, -E, dropper, where I can click on this and I can t um, determine the different colors of things on my screen. And so I can tell, OK, this blue is, is that color. And it copies the value of the color. And then in the div, I just want to make sure when I create the div that I use that same color. And so it, it creates a, a background that's that's interesting. And here is what the code looks like on this page. So you can replace, you can copy this code as it is and just put it into your own course. Um, you'll probably want to re replace the image with your own image that you make. Um, and then here's another, um, another trick that I do. The image has a certain height. And so in this case, I have the image height as 150. And the div, I also set to a height of 150. So that way it looks seamless. They're exactly the same height. And then the other thing I have, the um, image that I created is centered right in the middle. And so the code for that is I have the image. You want to enter style equals quotation mark. And then I have margin dash left and margin dash right as auto. And that means the space to the left of the image is going to be the same as the space to the right. It's essentially center aligning it. And if I didn't want it centered aligned, I can left align it and just have the div expand out to the right. And I just wouldn't have that um, margin left or margin right. I would just have the image. I would drop the image in there and in the div. And you can see the only styling I did to the div was I said, I want to make sure this is 150 pixels tall because that's how tall my image is. And I want the background color to be um, this color. And of course, I. When I copied the color, I have this unique code. This is called a hex code. Every single color on the internet has a hex code. And so I would just um, replace hashtag 2683C6 with whatever um, that one is. So that's an interesting way that you can make banners. I'll show you another page of banners in action. It's just a dummy page. But you know, just to give you some ideas, I went into um, PowerPoint, created a couple of images, and created some divs. I think this these um, images are probably about 60 pixels high. So I put the div for 60 pixels high. And in this case, this could be a syllabus page where I distinguish the different sections. Um, it could all be the same color if you want. And 
Again, these images could be left aligned as well, which I think would probably look better. And so let me just, oh, wait, I didn't mean to go next. I want to go, I want to go back. I'm spoiling the, spoiling the secret of the, the gifts that I was going to show you. It's not wanting me to go back. Uh, okay, there you go. I wanted to edit the page. So let me just take this header here. I'm going to go into the HTML editor and where it says margin left and margin right auto. I'm just going to take those out entirely and save that. I don't need it center aligned. And so that's what it looks like uh, left aligned. It's all the way to the left. And we can put a little bit of margin on the left or some padding on the left. I'll show you that in a, a moment, what, what the difference is between margins and paddings and how that can help the content of your course. But so that's you know an interesting way that you can distinguish different sections in your course. And so now let's look at imagery. I have a page here dedicated to the wonderful world of GIFs. Uh, GIFs are great. The original GIF, the hey, Sean, original, yeah, we have. I'll stop you really quick. Um, we've got a we've got a question that that you could answer really quickly for us. Kevin here from San Diego is saying super basic question, but what does div stand for? I don't know. Div is div is a div. I imagine division. Let's. Uh, what does div stand for? I just know it as the what you do. So division, I guess, is what it stands for. But um, a division, and I'll talk more about what divs are. It's essentially telling your your browser that here is a chunk of something. Here is a a section. Here's a thing, um, and it's invisible. You can't really see it unless you style it, like I did with the headers. I said, here's a div. I want it to be this tall, and I want it to be this color. Otherwise, I would never see what that is. Um, but it's it's a convenient tool. Um, for when you're in the back end of your pages. And we'll talk a little bit more about what you can do with, with divs as well. Awesome. So you get on to GIFs, um, and it is pronounced GIFs because I say so. <laughs> um, you're also correct if if you say GIF, but I will fight you. So just you know, just be mindful of that. You know, just keep that in consideration. But so GIFs are great. You know, give you can make GIFs, you can find them on the internet. If you find the one that's pertinent, put it in your course and what a GIF is, you know, there's there's a picture. A picture has frames. It has pixels and stuff. A GIF is a series of pictures, um, otherwise known as an animation. Um, and it depends on how many how many frames it shows per second. It might be eight. It might be twenty four. It might be high resolution or low resolution. Um, but they they'll play the sequence and then they'll just come back to the beginning and play the sequence. So it, it loops forever. And so it can be good for short snippets to demonstrate something. And there's plenty of educational gifts out there that might be very relevant to your course that can enhance the content of your pages. So here's one. This is one that I actually added today uh, because it just came out. Um, you know, the Nobel Prize was announced a couple of days ago. And so I put a little hover over this saying, Dr. Andrea Ghez uh, conducted pioneering research proving the existence of a supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy. That's kind of a big deal, you know, and I hope I pronounced her, her name right. Uh, here are some other examples. You know, you can compare sizes of things at a microscopic organism level or at a celestial level as well, comparing one star to another star. Here's a gift showing uh, cell division um, on a lattice light sheet microscope. Here's something interesting if you're teaching filmography or videography. I don't know what that's called. Filmography, is that a word? Um, you know, how they film Keanu's um, fall in John Wick 3, you know, and, and I've watched that a few times. It's pretty fascinating, you know. Get some Mythbusters here teaching about um, the Brachistrone curve and, you know, how that compares to other types of curves. Here's one that shows different frame rates, and I don't know whether what platform you're streaming on, if this actually shows well, but take a look at the course so that you can see the difference between 10 frames per second and 60 frames per second or 30 frames per second. You know, um, other gifts demonstrating the speed of light, you know, going around the earth seven and a half times every second or to the moon and back in around, uh, around two and a half seconds, or it might take three minutes, over three minutes for light to go from the earth to, to Mars, you know, and that's a relatively close planet. And so you think about how, how far away we are. There's gifts for cooking. There's gifts so that you can learn how Walt Disney 
used his camera to make innovative, you know, cinematography. There's a GIF on how to put a spin on a cue ball or why you should not lift with your back and why you should lift with your pages. And of course, there's also fun stuff out there too. You know, look for things that are interesting that just bring some levity. And these are very high resolution GIFs right here. So they're kind of, they're taking a while to load. Um, might have to, you know, give your computer a minute, but Neil deGrasse Tyson, I'll, I'll tell you, if he's not your favorite astrophysicist, then I don't know. I don't know about life anymore. <clears throat> he's great. Here's an example of a page where I use GIFs for my instructions. <clears throat> and this is an introduction assignment that I use in my classes. Instead of just a discussion board, which is, what's your name? Where are you from? What time zone are you in? What do you want to get out of this class? You know, it's, it's banal, but it, you know, we have to do it every semester at our institutions. We do it for attendance purposes. So we, we have to do it, but let's make it interesting. And so I have my students, um, instead of writing a discussion post, I have them create a Padlet and share a scrapbook with each other. And so I have my instructions and that's for screen reader. You always want to make sure everything's spelled out well. Um, and then I have some GIFs showing how to embed the Padlet into discussion posts because I don't want them to just put a, a link in a discussion post and say, here's my Padlet, you have to go visit it. I want them to actually embed it into the discussion. I want the discussion to be interactive. And so this GIF shows how to grab the embed code and then how to copy the embed code into uh, the discussion. And I need to update this GIF actually because of the new rich content editor. It looks slightly different, but the concepts are still the same. And I, Sean, yeah. question here um, from one of our faithful who's wondering, it, how are you creating GIFs? And and are you creating them really, or are you just grabbing them from other places? Oh, yes, and, and yes. Um, I'm not going to go into how to create GIFs on this um, session, but I can I can do another session on that. <clears throat> I, I tend to prefer using a platform called um, Snagit to create my GIFs. Um, and that way I can record some video and I can save it in GIF format. But otherwise, um, just ch I just do a Google search for educational GIFs. And there's probably a lot, a lot of lists out there. Um, if you go on image sharing platforms, I think I'm not going to go on Imager because I don't know what content's going to come up. But Imager.com, um, they have safe filters and, and stuff. Um, but you still never, <laughs> you never know what's going to pop up. Um, mostly it's innocuous. Right now it's all politics and coronavirus um, with a few cats on there. But um, yeah, you can search for gifts. There's, you know, you want to be mindful of your, the Creative Commons and um, copyrights for talk to your library or your institution if you have questions. Um, but I like to make my own. So I just do a screen recording either in Camtasia or Snagit. And then I just save it to my computer. Um, Snagit is really cheap for educators. I, I don't know how much, like maybe 30 bucks or something for a license if you have an EDU email address. And so I recommend talking to your department people or your institution, see if you can get a license. Otherwise, it's one that I'm willing to just pay out of pocket, you know. And there are very few things that I'm willing to spend money on, but Snagit's great because you can also do screen captures and mark on the screen with arrows and highlights, and that's really useful for students as well. And so here's what an example of what a Padlet would look like embedded. In this case, it's embedded in the instructions, um, but I have my students embed them in the, um, the actual discussion posts. And so for me, it's more meaningful to have the students scrapbook about themselves, whatever they want <clears throat> to share. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's, it's more meaningful for me than just to have them say, Here's what I want to get out of the course, and I'm, you know, happy to be in the course. Whatever, <laughs> you know. So my throat is dry over here. All right, so I'm gonna come to the next. So I talked a little bit about margins <clears throat> and padding. I'm positive about, about my throat. Um, this is an interesting concept for you to know. It's not something that you use all the time, but I, I use it a bit. Um, so you have content, you have padding, borders, margins. <clears throat> The way I think about it, and this is really silly, but think about a pillow, a throw pillow that you might have on your couch or your bed. And inside the throw pillow is a little marble. 
for whatever reason, I don't know why there would be a marble in the throw pillow, but those are marble. And so you have the pillow, the outside of the pillow, that would be the border of the pillow. The marble inside it would be the content and all of the padding, the fluff inside, you know, the batting is um, the, that would be the padding, you know, so it could be a thick, a thick, squishy pillow with a lot of padding, or it could be really thin that it doesn't have very much padding, or it could have no padding. It's just the marble with a case over it. And so the more padding you have, the more space there is between that marble and the pillow case. And then the margin <clears throat> is a little bit more silly. That's the space around the outside of the pillow. So that would be like if there's a large margin and you throw the pillow onto your, your bed and the pillow just floats above the bed. It doesn't touch anything. And then you put another pillow on top and it just kind of floats. You know, it's the space around that the pillow is, is floating. It's kind of silly, but that's how I think about it. All right, so how does that translate? That's kind of a silly example, but how does it translate into an actual Canvas course? Um, here's that div again that we were talking that we know it stands for division, which I have never bothered to look up in 12 years, but I just kind of figured uh, probably division. All right, so here I have some text, and around the text I put a border, and you can see the padding in between the border. So this is a 50 pixel padding. If it was 100 pixels, then this border would be twice as far away. If it was 20 pixels, it would be closer. At the border, I made it a color. This is deep space sparkle is the color. And the inside, I made kind of a grayish lavender. And this is what that code looks like then. So I have a div. <clears throat> I styled the background. I put a width of, um, of 600 pixels. So from left to right, this is 600 pixels. I put a border that's 15 pixels thick. It's solid instead of dashed or dotted or something. And then the color, this is that deep um, space sparkle is the color. I put a little bit of padding and I put a little margin. So there's 20 pixels margin all around it as well. And then I have the content. So this is the, the content of the space that I have here. So I just have this page. You can refer to this page. Um, it's just the concept of how, how a div works and how it can interact with padding and margins. And it's a, a really good thing. If you have a picture, you might want to put a margin around the picture um, so that the words don't come right up against the edge of it. So aesthetically, it can look good to maybe put 25 pixels to the left or to the bottom or to around it. And just do a Google, Google search for CSS margin. And you're going to have all kinds of resources. W3 Schools is right at the top of the list. That's my favorite. They let you. Um, see the concept and then you can try it for yourself and you can modify. So that's what a 70 pixel margin looks like. Let's run a 140 pixel margin or maybe a 20 pixel margin. So you can explore with the code before you actually put it into Canvas. But Google is your friend. If you're learning a little bit about coding, Google, Google. A little bit of YouTube, but yeah, Google. So let's um, talk about aligning images using the CSS. And that's really important because by default, the, mar the um, images just hang on the left side of the page. But in this case, I want to put maybe a couple of these, mar uh, these images on the right side of the page. So how would I do that? Let's dive in. I'm going to show you some, some um, HTML. And it's going to be basic HTML and CSS. So I have these three images right here, image one, two, and three. I'm going to go into the HTML editor, and I'm going to look for those images. I'm going to find them by the tag IMG, stands for image. And so I know that here's that first image, IMG, and I'm going to look until I find that second image. If you put spaces in the HTML editor, it doesn't really matter. Um, in order to ha actually have a return, it has to be a paragraph. And so this will just you know, not be anything. All right, so here are those three images. I want to move these, so I'm going to copy this. And on the rich content editor, you could drag and drop it. But I'm going to put it right here so it's aligned with that first paragraph. But I'm going to do a style real quick. So style is CSS equals um, do the, or the quotation mark. And I'm going to float it to the right. Float right, end with a semicolon. And so that's the simple code. Um, you can do a Google search if you forget after this. Um, do a Google search for CSS float or CSS, how to align images. All right, so let's float that to the right and hop back out and see what that looks like. 
looks like I copied the image. Let me just delete that and copy it. So now it's floating to the right. So that's pretty cool. Um, but the words come right up against the image. And like I said in that previous page, that's kind of odd. And so I'm going to add something to the style. So it's going to float on the right side of the page. The text will come to the left. And I'm going to put a margin on the left. And I'm going to put probably 25 pixels. I think that will be that should be fine. And maybe I'll put some um, margin on the bottom as well. Margin, bottom, and I will put that as also 25 pixels. All right, let's see how that looks. OK, now the words aren't coming quite up to the image. And I think aesthetically, that looks a little bit better. And so uh, let's take this other image. And this time, I'm going to, we'll, float, we'll keep it on the left but put some space around it. So I'm going to cut that instead of copying it. And I'll put this at the bottom, like right by the bottom paragraph. And I'm going to style it, style equals. And I'm going to put margin right. I'm going to put 25 pixels there. And then I won't put anything on the bottom, but maybe margin top. 25 pixels. About px instead of ps. All right, so I'll just go ahead and save that page, and we'll see how that looks. What? It didn't save it. I did something wrong. No, the code looks right. I don't know what's going on there. That was weird. I have never had that happen before, <laughs> but whatever. All right, so. Here are the pictures. I have one over here. Maybe I don't need that 25 pixels, so I can play around with that. Um, and also, you know, um, so we have this paragraph, we have this picture, and we have this other paragraph. I think I want the text to actually be on the right side. And so what I'm going to do is, just like the first one, I'm going to float it. So I'm going to look for the style. And this time, I'm going to float it on the left. That way, everything will come right up against the side of it. All right, so that looks good. And I, if we had time, I'd go back and probably just remove that um, margin on the top. I think we don't really need that. I'll just have it come uh, with, with no margin. And so that's how you can take images, and you can move them around. You don't have to have them just image text, image text. You can, you can play around with them, put some margins, float it around just a little bit. So what kind of images do you want then? And I'm not going to talk much about it. I, I have this page just to leave it for you to access afterwards. Um, but very briefly, there's a difference between a JPEG, a PNG, and a GIF. Um, JPEG is it's a lossy format, which means it compresses the image, which is good if you don't want too big of an image, like in a Word document or something. You don't want something that would be you know, 14 inches in real life. You just want something that's three inches. And so a GIF is a, or a PNG is a good way to compress the image so that the file isn't massive. You lose a little bit of quality, but really, you don't lose that much quality unless you make it super small and then you try and blow it up again. That's a, a bad practice. A PNG um, doesn't lose quality, and it supports a transparent background. Um, so does GIF. And GIF is distinguished between these because if it's animated, it will be a GIF. PNGs and, and JPEGs aren't animated. They tried to make an animated PNG. I think uh, Firefox try, or Mozilla, if I'm right, tried to make an animated one. It just didn't stick. So. Now we just use GIFs for that. What a transparent background looks like is if I were to have a gradient background with an image of cherries that have a drop shadow, and if it's a JPEG, even like you can't make the background transparent. And so there's always going to be a border as wide and as tall as the image. But with PNG, um, you can have a transparent background, which means you don't really see the border. The image is. Um, you know, it's the same as the, the JPEG right here, but I just made the background. So that, that can have an interesting effect as well, especially if you're working in PowerPoint or doing some kind of presentation. And of course, the OG GIF um, that really, you know, made the rounds was Dancing Babies and, uh, and Allie McBeal and all that. So you know, read through this page if you want to learn more. Where can you find good images? There are plenty of places where you can find awesome, high resolution, good quality images. And so this was a blog post that I wrote a few years ago. So I put the content up here on you know, how imagery can affect, um, positively influence the layout of your page. And then I have some, some places here. Pexels, 
Um, Pixabay, Pixabay is great because it has pictures and also videos. Uh, they're all Creative Commons and they're all accessible. You can use them in your course without um, any problems. Morgue File is also a great site. Unsplash is my favorite site and it's now supported by uh, Canvas. If I go to edit this and I want to insert an image, you have access to the Unsplash library. And so you can just do a search for computer, for example, and look at that. This is not like the Flickr Creative Commons where it's like, where it's somebody with a cell phone taking a poorly lit picture. Like these are pretty legitimate, good quality images that you can just drop into your course. So you just you know select it and you can submit it and embed it right onto the um, content the content page or assignment page. And you can put images anywhere that you have the rich content editor, which is everywhere. So that's announcements, Canvas pages, assignments, discussion boards, discussion threads, quizzes. So here's another, here's an example of how I have an image. I float it to the right. I put a little bit of margin to really enhance. The image isn't needed. In fact, if I look at the alt text, it's probably just picture of a computer or maybe it's decorative or something. Let's see image options. Oh, no, that's bad for me. No accessibility. I'm just going to put decorative image. I didn't run through this course. I didn't do an accessibility check around this course because I'm just you know playing around to, to show you some stuff. But you'd want to do that. You'd want to make sure that there's alt text for all of your images. And then I used Studio to drop in a couple of videos, caption the videos, which I think is important. You should always caption all of your videos. Uh, so this is an example of how I might do an assignment page. The text is the most important, but I also want to supplement it with some instruction. I make videos a lot for my students, and I think that's really important. I could throw a, a GIF in there as well. I could create a GIF. So on the next page, let's talk a little bit about layouts and the concepts of, of layouts. Um, and interrupt me if there are questions, if, you know, just, just stop me in my tracks and, and I can address whatever. But layout, um, you have different fundamentals. You have a, a 30, 70 layout option with text and imagery. If the image is important, then that, that could be a good layout. If it's a design and not really important, then maybe you'd stick to 30, 70 with the image just being more supplementary and the text being important. But it just depends. If you're working with an infographic, for example, where imagery might be important, there's also 50-50 layouts. Um, and I'll go to my home page where I, that's a 50-50 vertical layout, whereas this would be a, like a horizontal thing. So I, I promised you that I'd talk a little bit about the consumer psychology of um, you know, how to create the pages. So we'll get into that. Um, this is a, a simple chart, and this might be oversimplified, but um, you have people's attention for a limited amount of time, and they don't pay attention equally across the, the page. Mark, did you want to? jump in with a question? Yeah, I've got a couple. I mean, a big shout out uh, to you first off, Cheryl saying, so such so much fantastic information. I can't wait to share with my team. Thank you. Um, so let's take a couple of questions. We've got one here from Chris, where she's saying, can you resize the display image of a studio video? Yeah, let's, um, <clears throat> you have to get a little bit tricky. You have to get into the CSS, but it's totally possible. Um, where was that right here? This page where I had those studio videos. Um, so by default, I'm going to hop into here, go into Studio, and I can embed, I don't know, I'll just embed something. I want to allow for comments. So this is the default, and now I'm making my page look ugly, but you know, just for purposes, this is the default width and height that Studio um, puts the embeds the videos in. But you can see I made these ones smaller, thinking, they'll play it and make it full screen. And so how I do that is I go into the um, the HTML and I'll just see, okay, width and height um, of that video is 720 by 420. And so I'll take the half of that. So um, you know, 360 by, by 210, oops. All right, so when I redo that, then you can see, okay, so that's what, that, that makes it smaller. And that's how I do it. And you want to make sure that you do some conversions. So 360 over tw um, 220 or 210 is the same as 500 over X. You have to do a little bit of algebra. Um, and so if I were to say, you know, times three, let's, let's do, do this in our head. So that's 
900, 1,000, that's be 1080 times 630. If my math is is right, that should keep the dimensions. All right, so you want to do that because if I were to say, for example, width is 100% and the height is 150 pixels, it's going to look really wide and with a whole lot of black space. And this is just an extreme example. That's why you want to get the height and the width, the dimensions uh, about the same ratio so that you don't have a lot of weird uh, white space, but that's black space, I guess. Love it. Um, let's take this one from Rupert who's asking, let's ask for your opinion because there's there's different ways you could do it, but what's the best way to create an assignment? Don't you was. It depends on your entire process, really. Um, sometimes you can go into the calendar and you can just create placeholders for assignments. My calendar's having a hard time, you know, loading up, but you, you can definitely go into the calendar and just uh, click on a day and create placeholders for the assignments. I would want to make sure that it's in whatever class that I'm teaching and just put a placeholder for the assignment, the date, and then submit, and then you can go back and put the details in there, or you can create assignments as Canvas pages, and then when you're ready for it to be an assignment, then you can go create the assignment, copy everything over with the date and stuff, or you can go sequentially. I just, I have no answer. I guess you're asking for my opinion. Um, it's been well, a while I've done. I think your answer there is, it totally depends on your process, it depends on what you're doing. Um, so we'll take that as a good answer. Let's go on to this one from Milton who's saying, what about GIF buttons? How can I make a responsive text page? Is that, have you ever done that? Have you, have you created any buttons in Canvas that are, that are GIF formatted? I, I haven't, that would be worth brainstorming offline. Um, my reservation and by GIF, I'm assuming you're, we're talking about an animation. Correct. Um, the, the thing is the thing with that I like about the canvas buttons is that they look like buttons. And that's the thing is you don't want to confuse people because it's not intuitive that a GIF is clickable, if that makes sense. It, you have to tell them, um, click on the button below. Um, in that case, I would, uh, where's the where's the page where I have a, a GIF? Um, you can you can just um, hyper, hyperlink it to somewhere else. You can do that with any picture, in fact. Um, you can hyperlink a picture. Uh, in fact, let's you know, let's tinker around with maybe these gifts here, where um, the easiest way to do that probably would be to select this picture and put a link. And you could say uh, take the, take this to Google.com, or it can be a link to a different place on the the page or something. Uh, but I would probably stay away from clickable gifts just because it's not intuitive that it is clickable unless you say above it, click on this image, click on this be below in order to go to this place, you know? Great and feedback. For the same reason, I also, um, you know, we're talking about accessibility. When I emphasize text, these days I never use underline and I never use italicize and I don't make text blue because those are all indicators that it's a clickable link. You know, if I emphasize something, it's always, these days, it's always just bold. I just make it bold. And you also, also want to stay away from color as well for accessibility purposes. And so if I emphasize it, it's only for aesthetic purposes. It doesn't take away from the content that a student using a screen reader wouldn't have the, the semantics that a person who can see the, the content would. So you want to be mindful of, of these things. Accessibility has really changed the way that we think in higher education in the last few years. Question? Awesome. That's good. Keep going. All right. So, um, and I know right, we're at 45 minutes. I'll just keep talking. You, you don't know, no obligation to keep me talking, but you know, I'll go until instructor pulls the plug. Um, so we're talking about, you have, you have an element, a visual element. Um, people tend to gravitate towards the upper left-hand corner and that's for Western societies where they read from left to right, top to bottom. Other societies, they might read from right to left or even from top going down. Um, so I'm speaking clearly, or not clearly, but um, 
the, you know, specifically for English speaking audiences or audiences that read from left to right, top to bottom, they'll tend to um, spend the most of the time in the top left corner because that's how we read. So 41%, and I, I haven't verified, you know, the scientific empirical methodology of where these numbers come from, but I just take them as a rule of thumb that generally top left, and then they go from the to the right and go down to the top left. We spend less time at the end of a line than at the beginning of a line uh, on the page. And that's probably because we have a cadence and a rhythm as we're reading text. And then we go to the new line. We have to spend some time, make sure I'm on the right line. It happens in a micro second, but we, you know, we spend more time at the beginning of the line than the end of the line. So keep that in mind for the imagery that you use, as well as how you lay out a page that you want to make sure that people are seeing the content. So don't put the most important stuff in the bottom right-hand corner. And I want to do something fun with you right now. This is an ad for a Maserati. And um, I think this ad is brilliant. And I'm going to talk you through it because they, they take this paradigm and shake things up and force your attention. And that's ultimately what we're looking to do. We want our students to see as much of the content on the Canvas page as possible. So some of that is placing things where they should be and as well as trying to guide their attention um, purposefully, I would say. So if we take the, those numbers above, 42% of the time we're looking at the top left corner. But on this page, there's so much action going off, going on and on the top left corner, all we have is nothing. We have some gradients. We have some sky. Sky is not. Sky doesn't grab our attention, especially when there aren't clouds or things happening. And so all of the the buildings and stuff that's what grabs our attention. But it pulls us into essentially the logo of the car, the the grill of the car. We say that's interesting. There's contrast. There's black with white. It's framed. All these lines are pointing to it. And so we immediately are pulled to the center of the image. And then we want to stray. We want to go. There's lines that are taking us away from the image. But then we can see the background. Like our brains are amazing. We, in a split second, we can tell that background has a motion blur. And I know from the car, cars tend to move forward at a fast pace. So these buildings are moving away from me. And so you feel uncomfortable looking at this background because you know that the direction is moving in the opposite direction and in the opposite, you know, way. And so then you get all these lines, these clues. You have these wheels are turning. You know that they're turning forward and probably not. He's probably not cruising backwards. And all the lines of the car and all the lines in the road direct you back to the grill. And so, bam, number two for Maserati logo and grill. And then we want to venture down here. There's some contrast, so dark with light text. Always have light on dark or dark on light. And so that kind of pulls us in, but we're a little bit lazy. We don't want to read all those words. And then you notice all these lines just force us to look right back to that grill. And we're going to briefly glance down here. We're going to uh, notice you know, some high-end uh, brands of cars, Bentley and Rolls-Royce and all that. So we'll think, oh, that's interesting. But ultimately, I'm going to leave that and the lines all take me back. And so we're going to spend a lot of time right here. And what's crazy is all of this happens within one to three seconds, probably, maybe even less. But um, since it's so interesting, I would venture that we spend probably, we'd, you'd probably spend about three seconds on this if you're flipping through a magazine. It'll catch your attention just enough and you're gonna go through all of that stuff I described unconsciously and in, in a, just a, a fraction of a moment, really. So you know, we're obviously not teaching classes on Maserati or stuff, but how can we, how can we do that in our Canvas course? So this is the image I used at the home page. And if I divide this into the rule of thirds, like I did up there, I can look at the quadrants and I can say, okay, students tend to, they tend to look at the upper left-hand corner, but there's not much going on. It's a blank screen. Um, there's some contrast here in the plant, but it's nothing, nothing that would really grab our attention until we get to Einstein down here. And then we have something that's really light on a dark background. And so there's contrast. And so the first thing you're going to look at is probably Einstein's face. And we tend to recognize faces. We gravitate towards faces more than other objects. And if objects kind of resemble a face, we're going to look at that more than we will another object that might be right beside it. And that's since birth, you know, newborn babies are going to spend more time looking at a face than looking at something that's not a face. So that kind of catches our attention. And then there's some lines that take me to another face. 
and then the lines here on the computer take me nothing's really catching my attention i'm just taking notice that there's stuff this is a desk this could be my workstation it could be a student desk and then the grains of the wood the keyboard everything's pulling me back and so and then it brings me back to this face and so that probably is about one second that you're really looking at the image but it captures your attention in, in a meaningful way and so i've divided you know this is an image i got from unsplash i cropped it so that it would look good as a banner and that it would be aesthetic and meaningful and so uh, once again look at this in the context of my canvas course we have some limitations in that we don't have control over the student screens so they're going to have tabs they're going to have a url bar they might have some bookmarks they're going to have global navigation and although they can minimize the course navigation we don't know that they're going to do that so we have no control over any of these elements and they're cluttered and you know um, I speak highly of Canvas, but it is a lot of real estate that we don't have control over um, that is just kind of clutter on, on the screen. What we have control over is this little box right in the middle. And so we want to make use of that. So get an image that's meaningful to your course that really grabs and guides their attention. So I want them to notice Einstein, take a trip around the desk, land on Einstein, and just feel pleasant. You know, feel like, okay, this is good. And now let's get to the text. And the students are going to skip the description because they don't read that. But then there's some buttons that they can interact with. And so, you know, that's how I lay out my page. Not necessarily with that image always, but something like that. So I talked about grab their attention, keep it focused. Um, there's some ways that we can do that. And one is to employ novelty. And so this is just a PowerPoint um, that I put into the, the page here to emphasize we have various elements on here and if i want to grab your attention i can change the color of one of those and that way you're, you're looking at this this dark blue thing mark i dare you to just try and look at one of these other elements without getting pulled back into that dark blue thing yeah you win you win <laughs> all right what if we change the size you know try looking at those other four that aren't that big huge one we just really love novel things and they they stand out if one's a slightly displaced same thing if one's a slightly different shape, you know, Sesame Street, they knew what they were doing and <laughs> teaching us how to distinguish things. Look at all of those things. So, you know, you can really pull attention to something. What you don't want to do, you can try color, placement, size, or shape. Don't do all of it at the same time. And you might think, oh, this is silly, but for real, I have seen so many syllabi where people think, all right, let's put a banner. Now let's put a graphic. Now let's make this uh, big text. Now let's change it to yellow and let's, you know, put, polka dots and do all of these things. When everything is novel, then nothing is. And it just doesn't look good. It's not appealing. It's overwhelming for students visually. You know, it almost makes you nauseous because there's so many things. And I've had um, you know, wonderful teacher um, when I was an instructional designer, but her syllabus was 120 pages long and it was it was like confetti, you know, and um, and I couldn't change I couldn't change the way she did things. But just just be mindful. It's kind of like um, the, what's the Pixar cartoon, The Incredibles, where if everybody's super, then that means nobody is. And it's the same thing with novelty. If, if everything's trying to catch your attention, then nothing will. And the students are going to be overwhelmed and they're going to leave. I think um, for time, I'm not going to talk much about fonts. This page is up there. Um, serif and sans serif. In Canvas, they make it so easy because all of the fonts are very readable. Uh, but if you're incorporating another element like a document, you just wanna be mindful of the readability of the font and you can do a Google search for that. If you're using fonts on the Canvas page, the two tricks that I have are, don't use a whole lot of different sizes for the fonts. Either stick with one font, and in this case, it's the same font, um, and I changed the size and the color and I made it bold, but it's the same font. And this one, I use different fonts and then I changed the size and the, and the color. I don't want to use more than two different types of fonts on if you can avoid it, you know, maybe three, um, but you don't want to have a whole library full of fonts and sizes and colors on your document. Any uh, questions before I move on to a, a different concept? No, nope, let's keep going. Talk about embedding content. Embedding is just one of my favorite things in Canvas. They make it so easy. And I've done a session at InstructureCon um, I think it was the carnival one. Um, oh, and by the way, I didn't shout out. So 
Here's my instructor con in case you're wondering why I'm not dressed up with a button down shirt. This is my my canvas shirt. I decided, let me pick one of the canvas shirts. And it ends up not making the camera, but this is uh Instructor Con 0017, I think was And what what we should do while you're while you're talking about that, everyone, Canvas Con, which is our virtual version of Instructor Con, is one week from this very day. One week from right now, we will be listening to keynotes. But you need to go and register. And registration closes tomorrow at 5 p.m. Mountain. I'm going to drop a link in here. Sean's going to be there. I'm going to be there. Don't miss it. Uh, the swag is going to be incredible, I can promise you. And even more, the content is going to be stellar. So with that, Sean, keep on going. Yeah. Listen to LeVar Burton. Go see Sal Khan. And, of course, me, you know, the big celebrity, the not technically keynote because, you know, they don't, didn't want to overshadow Sal and and the VAR, but uh, I think I'm talking about, um, I, I, we, I recorded it already, but we're, I'm talking about a transitioning or engaging students in online learning, especially during the pandemic where not everybody teaches online and how to do that. Um, so embedding is a topic that I talk about sometimes at conferences because there's so many tools and they can fit right into Canvas. You don't need to hyperlink and have students go outside of Canvas. The purpose of embedding is that there's some awesome content out there like the Padlet that I showed you or ThingLink. And you can put that right into a Canvas page without the students even leaving. And it looks great a lot of times. Not everything's embeddable, but so to embed the content, you'd want to grab the embed code from that platform and either go to the HTML editor, if you're on the old rich content editor, or look for some kind of HTML symbol, which are those brackets with the slash in there. Um, and then you can also, um, import the media. There's an embed button. When you upload the media, you can paste the embed code in that way, which I think is a little bit easier. You just put the cursor on the page where you want the embedded content to be, and then you can put the embed code in there. And it looks great. So where do you get embed code? Um, usually ed tech platforms allow you to embed into the LMS. And so you'll look for something that either says embed, or it will say share, or this is the universal symbol for like HTML, and so usually the embed code will be there. If it's pull everywhere, you can embed the pull. Uh, these are different platforms where you can get embedded content, like news articles or Flipgrid or Sway, Prezi. So look for the embed code. Once you copy that embed code, this is what it'll look like. Sometimes it's easy. It's just an iframe with a source. Sometimes it's this big, huge, you know, Greek alphanumeric um, text that you don't even think about it just whatever they tell you to copy copy it and then in your canvas course you'll paste it where you want it to be um, if you do want to know the the basics of an iframe which is typically a lot of the embed code will be an iframe um, the iframe essentially tells canvas that i'm going to place something from outside into the the course right here and in this case, I want it to be a width of 560 by 315, which is a 16 by nine ratio. So I'm probably embedding a video. And sure enough, um, here's the video that I'm embedding. It's the source equals, and then the website where the embedded content is. And usually that source will have something like embed in there. And that's just telling Canvas, this is the content that I want in there. And I want it to be this high and this wide. So here's an example of uh, some embedded content, just a, a dummy page here. I have the title, I have some text, I have a hyperlink to a Sway, and then I also have a Sway that's embedded in here. And embedding is good because um, you can go to modules and you can just take, you can grab the link and make a, a file page or something. But I like embedding because that way I can have other images, other text, that the content is part of the page instead of it is the page and that's the only thing on the page. And so in this case for Sway, I'd want to share the content, grab the embed code, I'd copy that, and just paste it into Canvas using that method. And that way you can have additional interactivity. You know, this is a, a butterfly garden, something that my wife did, and she presented to the school, the PTO and the, the school advisory council to try and get a pollinator garden. So she created this, you know, to, to try and convince them. And it's really interesting to get content in in the canvas page here's another one we already looked at the padlet this is my my padlet that i use for my introduction board and you can see that it embeds cleanly into canvas and it interacts and i can 
pop out to to Padlet, but I can I like just keeping it right into Canvas because I don't want students to leave my Canvas course because once they're on the internet, well now they're on the internet even though they were before you know, but I don't want them to get distracted by uh, YouTube or blogs or games or you know whatever looking at cat pictures like we all tend to do. It's another example of embedded content. This one is ThingLink. This is, I was testing my 360 cameras for the InstructureCon session that I did last year. I talked about 360 and how to get that into Canvas. And so I created a, a, you know, a 360 image with some hotspots and you can just embed that right into Canvas. It can be a flat image as well with interactions. You can have maps, voiceovers, you can play videos. And so really dress up your page. Um, I'm thinking, I haven't done this yet, but I'm thinking for an about me page or a, a course overview page of having an image and then kind of the, like the syllabus would have interactive elements that they can, I can talk about different parts of the course and have like either a picture of a document or a picture of something related to the course. I haven't done that yet. I've been, it's in my mind for the past year, like I should use ThingLink as my, you know, as a page in Canvas that's like a, course orientation. If anybody if Sean, share it with me. <laughs> let's take this one from Courtney. For anybody who doesn't know Courtney, you need to know her. She is a Canvas rock star. She is one of the founders of the Canvas for Secondary Educators group on Facebook that's kind of blown up the past little bit. Big shout out to Courtney and Tammy Neal. Um, but Courtney's wondering here, um, how about embedding PowerPoints like you had on your page with the novelty topic? People seem to be having issues doing that. Um, she's a Google school, so she has no idea how to help. Any ideas? Um, I'm going to give you a link, actually. I'll put that in, in the chat that you can share. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, I, I created a video uh, probably a month or two ago about how to embed PowerPoint into Canvas. And so feel free to share that link and you can see how I did that. Um, essentially what I did, I, I we have a subscription to Office 365. And so I um, had to embed it from OneDrive, go onto OneDrive and go to share and they have embed code that you can put into Canvas and that's how I did it. And if for some reason you have to do that from OneDrive, from a PowerPoint being on OneDrive, as opposed to, um, you know, just if I click share here, I don't have that embed option on the desktop version of PowerPoint, but I do on, on OneDrive and so, that's pretty much what you have to do. Just grab the embed code from OneDrive and put it on your Canvas course in the HTML <clears throat> window <clears throat> or uh, through the embed tab that I showed you a moment ago. <clears throat> so let's plow through. Um, Pull Everywhere is an all, uh, a great tool that you can use as well. Um, here I have the results of a poll. If you wanna take the poll, then here's the, the link to do that and then I use this sometimes for my classes, just wanting to know, you know, roughly where are people in the world? I have a lot of international students in my class, not all the time, but um, but occasionally in, across the U.S. And so it's interesting to see. In this case, we have somebody from Hawaii. Looks like Oahu, looks like uh, New Zealand and Botswana, Egypt, um, inland Sao Paulo area in Brazil and all over the U.S. And uh, Mexico looks like maybe Oaxaca or Pueblo Mexico. And uh, so, yeah, that can be an interesting way to engage students as well. Um, you, if you're teaching a real class, you can have the Canvas page up or put it in uh, PowerPoint as well. You can, they, they'll give you um, slides that you can put into your slide deck to yeah, get interactive. Um, so I'm going to speed through a little bit. I know we're over time. H5P.org is an interesting website where you can create HTML interactions and then they give you embed code and then you can put it into Canvas. And so I was tinkering around with that a bit and created a drop down menu, you know, with, with various, um, you know, elements on there. This is what the embed code looks like. And I would just copy that and paste it onto the canvas course. YouTube. I have just one thing to say about YouTube is it's easy to embed code in YouTube. You just take the URL. Um, in fact, I have one on my clipboard since I just copied you. And you just paste it on there, hit enter, and Canvas knows that, okay, that's a YouTube video. And it'll create a little thumbnail and have the player embed in there. 
I prefer actually going to YouTube and grabbing their embed code. So if I were to, let me see, share this. It's really easy. You just click on share. <clears throat> Here's the embed icon, and you don't even have to think about that. Just select it and copy it, and then go into the HTML editor and paste it. And that way, it comes up with a, a full, like a, a thumbnail for one. This thumbnail is just a random frame from somewhere in the video. This uses the actual YouTube thumbnail and the YouTube player. And so, and I can control how big it is. You know, I used to be able to control it from there, but essentially here's the height is 560 by 315. Those are pixels. And so for this one, I made it a little bit bigger. That looks like it's at least probably a thousand pixels wide, I would say. 1120 by 630. And so I would say, um, I don't know, what, what am I looking at? Five, uh, 560 by 315. Or so I think that, you know, if you compare the two of these, I just think that embedded YouTube content looks better than just pl placing the hyperlink and hitting enter. Although, you know, you get started, you know, if you want to put the video on, do what you can, do what you're comfortable with, um, but also explore the concept of embedding content. It's going to really help you dress up your pages and, you know, I think make them look better. So that's the content I have for you, Mark. Any other questions? This is fantastic. People are absolutely loving it. Unfortunately, Sean, you have cemented yourself in having to come back and do these on a regular basis. Um, so don't worry, everyone who's out there thinking Sean is an absolute rock star. He is, and we will have him back many more times, we promise. With that, everyone, don't forget to register for CanvasCon. Sean is speaking. Uh, content is going to be incredible. I've seen I've seen some of it and it's really fantastic. Sorry for the kid in the background who's not very happy right now that I'm that I'm talking on a live stream. You all get it. With all of that, uh, we're excited to, to be back with you again tomorrow morning. We've actually got two rock star sessions set up tomorrow morning. One at 8.30 with the Canvas Queen, Lauren Burleson, and another one at 10.30 with New Caney ISD. So thanks everybody. Big thanks to Sean. Uh, we will see everybody tomorrow morning. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for having me.